Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about aircraft size. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the Boeing XF-8B and its sheer size when compared to other carrier-based fighters of that era. That plane, measuring in at about 13 meters long and 16 meters wide, weighing 20,000 pounds gross, was considered to be too large for aircraft carriers at the time. After all, space on a carrier is finite, and you have to allocate that space properly, factoring in both aircraft quality and quantity. Now, that plane had a lot going for it. It was advanced as far as prop planes are concerned, and it was quite versatile, being able to potentially fill five different roles in one aircraft. The reason I bring this plane up is because, while it was considered to be too big at the time, what if an aircraft company from around the same time decided to make something bigger, heavier, and much less versatile? How do you think that would go? This is the Douglas XTB-2D Sky Pirate. The story of the Sky Pirate begins in early 1942 with a call to action from the Navy. Around that time, a new, larger class of aircraft carriers was announced, the Midway Class. It was not at that time called the Midway Class, mind you, but rather CVB-41. Regardless of the name at the moment, a new, larger class of carriers was on the horizon. With this increase in carrier size coming, this meant that the Navy could field greater numbers of aircraft or aircraft of greater size. For these new, larger carriers and the existing Essex-class carriers, but mainly for the new class, the Navy announced a design competition for a new torpedo bomber, with secondary scout and level bombing roles. As the Navy wanted what would effectively be a light bomber, they assumed any proposed design would be a multi-engine aircraft. The Douglas Aircraft Company, which you may know from the TBD Devastator, the aircraft that was basically cannon fodder at Midway, would subvert the Navy's expectations by presenting a single-engine design with a quasi-twin-engine effect to it in the form of a twin contra-rotating propeller. Their design, then known simply as the Devastator II, would eventually win the competition, and in November 1942, the Navy requested a mock-up of the design to be presented for inspection. Sometime in early 1943, the Navy inspected the mock-up and was satisfied giving Douglas the green light for the production of 23 pre-production models. Later that same year, in October, an order was placed by the Navy for two flyable prototypes, one of which would have a longer tail section than the other for testing purposes. For the standard model, measuring in at 14 meters long and over 21 meters wide, the Sky Pirate was truly in a class of its own when it came to single-engine aircraft at the time. In fact, it was so large that it just about matched the B-25 Mitchell medium bomber in size, and if produced, it would be the largest carrier-based single-engine aircraft ever made. With an empty weight of 18,405 pounds, the Sky Pirate again would match the Mitchell and its roughly 19,000 pound empty weight. Having the sheer size that it did, the Sky Pirate would be given an equally sizable armament to help match it. At a baseline, it would be outfitted with seven 50 caliber machine guns. Four of the machine guns would be mounted in the wings, two on either side. A rear facing dorsal turret would be outfitted with two machine guns and the final seventh gun would be mounted under the tail as a ventral turret. The more impressive element of the armament would be the bomb and torpedo load that would be incredibly large for a single-engine aircraft of the era. If taking off from a mainland runway, the Sky Pirate could be outfitted with four Mark 13 torpedoes, each of which weighed 2,000 pounds. 
If taking off from a carrier, this would have to be reduced down to two torpedoes. However, even reduced down to two torpedoes, this was still double the amount of the more contemporary Grumman TBF Avenger. At the maximum, it was four times the amount. By torpedo bomber standards, the Sky Pirate was packing some serious firepower. Additionally, in an alternate configuration, the Sky Pirate could outperform or rival standard bombers, medium or heavy. It could carry upwards of 8,400 pounds of bombs. Compare that again to the B-25 Mitchell that could only hold 3,000 pounds. Compare it to the B-17 Flying Fortress as well, that in its bomb bay could only hold 8,000 pounds. Now, the B-17 could hold more externally, but still, the fact remains that the Sky Pirate could match the B-17's bomb bay at its baseline. Now, to get this hulking mass of an airplane off the ground with just one engine, it would need quite the powerful one. Funnily enough, the Sky Pirate would use the exact same engine as the Boeing XF-8B, the then-in-development Pratt & Whitney XR-4360, with around 3,000 horsepower. With the Sky Pirate being a good bit bigger and heavier than the XF-8B, it would also be a good bit slower as a result. Still, with a top speed of 340 miles an hour, it was still 140 miles an hour faster than the original Devastator torpedo bomber, 60 miles an hour than Grumman's Avenger, and 30 miles an hour faster than the Sea Wolf. As for the rest of the aircraft's design, there are three things that stand out the most. The wings, the landing gear, and the tail. The wings were sort of inverted gull wings, but not in the standard sense in how they would normally angle downwards and then upwards. The wings of the Sky Pirate instead went from horizontal to an upward angle. I could not find any listed reason as to why. Typically on inverted gull wing aircraft, this kind of design is used to increase landing gear strength or to increase the amount of room under the fuselage for bombs. The Sky Pirate's wings wouldn't really accomplish either of these, so I have to assume it was for some beneficial aerodynamic effect. Additionally, the wings, as was typical for carrier-based aircraft, folded inwards towards the body, with the pivot point being where the wings angled up. With the landing gear, on the other hand, it was of a tricycle design a design not typically seen on U.S. carrier-based aircraft at the time. This would be done to make it easier to load bombs onto the wings. Finally, with the tail, as mentioned previously, the two prototypes would have two different tail sections. The first prototype would have a tail measuring in at just over 3 meters long, and the second prototype would have a tail measuring at just over 2.5 meters. The difference in this design was likely done to try and save space on the carriers, as making the planes even just this little bit shorter would be rather beneficial. All in all, combine everything about the Sky Pirate, the size, the speed, and the armament, it seems as though it, while oversized, would be a major step up in the overall destructive capabilities of U.S. torpedo bombers. If testing and production went smoothly, the Sky Pirate could easily be the best torpedo bomber seen in the Second World War. That is, though, if testing and production went smoothly, and it absolutely did not. And the Sky Pirate would have major issues that were largely out of its control. The first and most significant issue was the engine. As the 4360 was still in development, it would be rather difficult to procure an engine for the Sky Pirate. The first flight of any kind on any aircraft with the 4360 engine was back in 1942, and in 1943, just 10 prototype models of the engine were in existence. To put it simply, the engine the Sky Pirate was supposed to use was in very short supply, and given the aircraft's size and weight, it needed that engine specifically. 
There wasn't really a replacement because there wasn't anything that really compared to the 4360. By 1944, the Sky Pirate still didn't have an engine, and it wouldn't receive one until early 1945. And by early 1945, the landscape of the war had drastically changed. The Japanese naval fleet was basically annihilated, so in that respect, the Sky Pirate wasn't really needed anymore. The remnants of the Japanese Navy could be swept up by what the U.S. currently had in the Avenger and the Seawolf. The Germans also didn't have much of a navy to speak of either, apart from their U-boats, so the Sky Pirate wouldn't really be needed over in Europe either. For some added salt to the wound, the Midway class of carriers initially intended to be used in World War II were rather slow in their production. The first of its class, the USS Midway, was finally commissioned in September 1945, after the war was already over. Outside of the production delays, though, the general concept of a designated torpedo bomber was beginning to fall out of favor for the Navy. Multi-role fighter bombers provided much more versatility than specially designed torpedo bombers. Now, these more versatile aircraft weren't as proficient in that specific area, to be sure, but the ability to do almost anything made them much more preferable to military higher-ups. The usefulness of the more versatile multi-role aircraft made the Sky Pirate expendable. So expendable, in fact, that in May 1944, the project was already at a risk of being cancelled before it could ever fly. Luckily for the project, though, it would be allowed to continue, and it would be able to finally fly after receiving its engine in early 1945. Even then, though, flight testing wasn't smooth either. Flying from between May and August 1945, the Sky Pirate was plagued with engine issues and various accidents. The developmental engine was not reliable and was prone to failure. Its wings were also an issue, and damage to them caused delays. And the effective final nail in its coffin was a propeller issue meant that the Sky Pirate would be grounded from August onwards. In the meantime, with the ascension of jet engine technology and a general decline of interest in the design from the Navy, several different design proposals were made to help keep the project going. From installing a jet engine to making it a recon aircraft to making it a dedicated anti-submarine aircraft, all of these ideas would be presented but never acted upon. By 1947, the project would be cancelled, and in 1948, both prototype models would be scrapped. Overall, the failure of the Sky Pirate was due to a web of issues. Because the plane was so large, it couldn't really be used on the carriers that the Navy had at the time. As production on Midway-class carriers was rather slow, this would mean that even if the Sky Pirate's engine wasn't severely delayed, it still wouldn't really have a home. It could be used on Essex-class carriers, don't get me wrong, but that was not the primary intention. So with delays in both the carrier and the engine, and the rise of jet engine technology, the Sky Pirate's overall concept never really stood a chance. In the end, it didn't have another role that it could fill that other aircraft already in production weren't already filling, and thus it was not needed anymore and would thus be cancelled. Alright, and with that, we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Personally, I would like to know why no other plane has been named the Sky Pirate. It's a really, really good name. I think it would fit perfectly for a torpedo bomber, as it already was, but it would also work pretty well with a flying boat. You know, pirates are often in boats, so flying boat, Sky Pirate, the connection is right there. I think the military really needs to upgrade its name game. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!